So we are now um, going to conclude with our student presentations. Our program directors um, and faculty have recommended students from each department to make these presentations. Uh, each presenter will have five minutes and will also be Pecha Kucha style, uh, but without, without the Q&A at the conclusion. Uh, and Anita Beresbetia, Professor of Landscape Architecture, Director of the Master of Landscape Architecture Program, and the Faculty Curator, curator for this session will introduce the students. Anita. Thanks, Grace. Uh, I am not going to say um, anything uh, new by saying that studio is at the heart and soul of the GST. And it is at the heart of, and soul of the GST because of the more than 550 talented, energetic, and creative individuals from every continent that bring not only a very broad range of interests, but a commitment to engage the world through design. So, as Grace mentioned, in the next 25 minutes, we will hear from five of these individuals. Uh, these um, presentations will be very concise and fast-paced. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this type of pre presentation, uh, the rules are the following. Each student will present 15 slides, and each slide will be on for 20 seconds. The presentation is advanced automatically with a timeout at five minutes. So I will introduce all of the students first, and the presentation will follow in the same order. Uh, Joshua Feldman is a third year uh, student in the MRC1 program, in his, uh, and he has taken an option studio with Achim Mendes on material performance. Joshua is originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. He studied at the University of Cape Town before transferring to Yale, where he completed his Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in architecture, and he has worked with Robert A.M. Stern Architects and Architects and Shop at New York City. Sarah Sodi is, the, is in her final year of the Master of Landscape Architecture One program. She has a previous Master of City Planning degree from MIT and a BA from Boston University. Her professional experiences include city planning in her hometowns of New Orleans and Houston, a year-long internship designing landscapes with Hood Design in Oakland under Walter Hood, and a transportation uh, planning in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Sarah was recently named a 2014 National Olmsted Scholar by the Landscape Architecture Foundation. She intends to use the award to return to Rio de Janeiro and New Orleans to continue working on local efforts to design culturally and ecologically relevant urban landscapes. Amanda Huang is a second year urban design and MDES real estate student. She earned her Bachelor of Architecture and minor in urban planning from Cornell University and has worked as an architect um, uh, in the past few years, uh, based in Paris, London, and most recently in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, where she worked at the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, in the newly established Design Lab. Her current research interest relates to design, politics, and community engagement in development, developing cities. Grace Yu is a second year urban design student. She has an architecture background from McGill University in Montreal and worked, has worked in Copenhagen, Denmark before coming to the GSD. Her current interest lies in the convergence of informal economic development in the global north and south. Mai Tam Nguyen is a Master of Urban Planning student. Prior to her time at Harvard, she spent many years as a public engagement and social media lead for the City of Seattle Department of Planning and Development, with projects ranging from a multicultural center for Seattle's diverse immigrant community to the redesign of the city's central waterfront. She also served as a new media manager for Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State. She's interested in economic development and policy strategies for the inclusion of immigrant community in Western Europe. Matthew Conway is a fifth year MRC1 student. He's currently a teaching assistant for digital media um, uh, two with Andrew Witt and an executive officer uh, of Asia GSD. Recently, he received a research grant from Harvard's University Rush Hauer Institute of Japanese Studies for a book on contemporary Japanese house design. 
Conway graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies with high distinction from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln with minors in Japanese, Mathematics, Asian Studies, and Art. In addition to this presentation, if you have not done so already, please visit the student work show uh, in the pit where there's approximately 70 students on display in the um, TV screens. Josh. Design in the architecture department at the GSD is process driven. Our projects are set up in an open-ended way which encourage design exploration through iteration, assessment, and improvement. I see my design work not merely as a solution to a given brief or studio assignment, but as research in the search of knowledge. Here we see my first semester design for the lock project, which was situated between the Boston Harbor and the Charles River Basin. The assignment called for three discrete organizations of space while enabling the passage of pedestrians and boats. The design went through multiple iterations while always trying to study the image of the continuous as a platform for design. Experimentation with the basic principles of the piston engine led to the development of this kinetic building. By harnessing uh, the passage of the boat through the lock, I arrived at the building's three different states of occupation. My project developed into a maritime museum whereby visitors could observe boats from various rooms within the structure. In model form, we see how the movement of the building is recorded through a series of individually customized frames, which express the three distinct states of occupation in ruptures along the surface. The knowledge that I gained from this project was rooted in the understanding of mechanical tectonics and dynamic space. The final project of my second semester in the core program called for a new greenhouse facility on the Wellesley College campus. In considering the programs of the greenhouses, faculty offices, laboratories, tour groups, and visiting students, the project functioned simultaneously as a museum, school, and research facility. Through various design studies, which included the quality of light required by the seasonal gardens, the orientation of the building on site, and the optimum angle of rotation to allow for passage from the existing science center. The project was reconfigured in response to site-specific characteristics and the requirements of a dispersed campus. By reconceptualizing the workbench as a continuous planting bed, the building provides interior and exterior planting space, both within the greenhouse and the waffle slab ceiling. In this way, the building reimagines the topography of the site through a series of rooftop gardens and rolling strips of vegetation. Moving up in scale now, this slide shows the model for the design of a multi-program urban building consisting of a gymnasium, thermal baths, and a hotel sited in desert climate. My project sought to produce exterior public space by activating and celebrating the ground plane for social, cultural, and economic interaction. Through an initial fascination with the ubiquitous use of gold in Dubai, I carried out a set of these models, teasing out some of the building's programmatic requirements and responses to the harsh arid climate. Here specifically, the design process took on a somewhat autonomous nature, which informed the most crucial aspects of the project. The program divided the building into three discrete zones separated by elevated ground planes, which offered external gathering spaces for the hotel guests and public bathers alike. A staggered vertical circulation activated the elevated ground planes by encouraging passage across the building at the swimming pool levels. While my project does not aim to compete with the iconic nature of Dubai's towers, it does attempt to reconcile Dubai's social, cultural, and economic polarities. It is grounded in a subtle acknowledgement of Arabic motifs, but does not depend on any pattern for its genesis of the form. As such, design becomes the knowledge of a place. This urban scale project <clears throat> examines the critical relationship between the individual and the collective. By understanding the city as aggregations of flow, traffic flows, pedestrian flows, subway flows, etc., this group project aims to reimagine the flow of compact vehicles in relation to high density living in the Gowanus neighborhood. Various modes of transportation are integrated into the building, permitting residents vehicular access to their front door. 
The building facilitates the switching of transportation modes for pedestrians arriving either at the ferry or subway stops. A spiraling car share hub generates the building's vertical circulation, seamlessly connecting it to the nearby expressway. Here we see a plan of the building and a sample of the living units. We see the corridors become one-way streets and apartments allow the vehicle to be parked in the unit. By re-examining compact living and speculating about the future of design, I am able to further my knowledge and understanding of pertinent issues relating to the automobile industry. Design at the GSD really is a way of probing and extending the limits of knowledge. Whether it is shared knowledge that comes from my studio full of talented young architects, or technical knowledge gained from robot fabrication workshops, or even the knowledge gained from synthesizing two years of intense work in the MRC1 program into a five-minute Pecha Kucha presentation. <laughs> no matter the task, design at the GSD is a research-driven pursuit of knowledge. I believe the way we understand people in the design process is an area worth innovating, and that the discourses we are developing in landscape architecture at the GSD provide the theoretical terrain to do so. And that in doing so, we as a creative field make available a wider range of precedents and inspiration for ecological design, aesthetics, and form. The fourth semester of the MLA core focuses on the premise that urban form should be generated by ecological processes in the vulnerable Jamaica Bay of New York City. My studio partner, Hector Trita Picar, and I, together with instructor Sergio Lopez Pinheiro, recognized an opportunity to test ecological design by analyzing not only the physical properties of our given ecological process, which was fog, but to explore its experiential, cultural, and political underpinnings. We started by looking at the significance of fog throughout history and found that fog has been heavily associated with celestial phenomena since ancient times, strongly linked to the philosophical trends of the society. As a cloud that forms near the surface of the earth, it has long been understood as the heavens reaching down to the earth. Today, global markets, extreme transparency, and rapid ac uh, access to vast amounts of knowledge have defeated localized belief systems and the sense of the divine in our everyday lives. The emerging global community will increasingly be brought together by our sense of alienation, isolation, and fear. In this context, we decided to employ fog's atmospheric qualities. It blurs, it flattens, it intimacizes, it slows. In the fog, we could create a densely populated community, highly connected, both physically and virtually. But by visibly blurring the metropolis, we would simultaneously support an intimate and removed setting. Our aim was to use the divine presence of fog to create an ideal urban dichotomy, a connected withdrawal. So we explored the potential of landform to increase the probability of fog generation and capture, finding that we could create conditions for varying water temperatures in the bay through topographic interventions. These interventions took the form of basins reaching the depth of the bay where cooler waters would collect, each with a shallow rim where water warmers would collect. We generated a field of these basins whose sizes and positions were determined by the dominant winds in the bay. A corresponding set system of ridges cap and intensify the fog and double as a circulation system for our new city out over the bay. This urban development takes the form of a houseboat community with each fog basin serving as a dock uh, for a small cluster of houseboats. The system is also structured to erode and phase inland as tides continue to rise. You'll see uh, in the next sequence of images those rising tides and how the nature of circulation shifts and how the system effectively moves inland over time. And while this all may seem fantastical in a way, I'd say that you shouldn't let our methods of representation fool you with this project. We understood our project as responding to real ecological, political, social, and financial pressures of the metropolis. These pressures often contradict one another. So we used the experiential qualities of fog to subvert the layers of dichotomy that are inherent in the concept of an ecological urbanism. As property values continue to skyrocket in New York City, the waters surrounding it offered the opportunity to offset some of this pressure. And we knew that it had happened before. We looked at the case of the California gold rush and the subsequent economic booms, and how Sausalito's strategic proximity to San Francisco was a key factor in its formation as a houseboat community. We created a stacking system for the houseboats to provide a range of densities and FARs to accommodate future economic and ecological pressures. 
The increasingly transient and unanchored nature of our society lends itself to this mobile lifestyle, and we see the project connecting to a regional system of communities like it that people can move, can move betwixt as desired. The subtext here was that our project was, in fact, ecological. These basins in the bay actually break wave strength and the storm surge that the area is so susceptible to, which is, in a way, paradoxical. At the same time that it is, in effect, rejecting the city, the formation of these basins are also serving as a barrier, safeguarding the rest of the metropolis. Now, in the case of this project, there was no sort of existing community, and at its very core, it, this is an academic exercise. But as landscape architects position themselves to take on larger scales of work in the urban realm and aim to incorporate ecology into the way that we understand that urban realm, we must also demonstrate a deeper inclusion of experience, politi politics, and culture in contemporary design discourse. In a way, these questions are not new, and they've been asked by theorists of other fields. However, I see the potential of their translation into landscape architecture as an area of our field in need of investment. Thank you. For Elements of Urban Design core studio with Professor Anita Bears-Betia, we worked in teams of two to develop a set of urban strategies for sites situated along the Harlem River. The studio speculates on the role of the urban designer in shaping complex metropolitan systems, especially one as diverse as that of Harlem and the Bronx. Our research began with urban scale analysis of existing policies and programs in New York City. Various incentives and tax credits address issues with urban development and areas with limited resources. And these invisible forces shape the city. Recent effort has emphasized the need for accessible fresh food and raised awareness of healthy living. Responding to New York City's call for action, we study overlaps of programs and policies, as well as possible loopholes to reveal opportunities for design intervention. We couple fresh food and affordable housing to serve as a catalyst and lay the groundwork for local community while bridging public and private stakeholders. While research acts as a valuable tool that can effectively inform the conceptual framework of design, mapping allowed the physical implications of zoning to manifest at multiple scales. Overlaps of incentivized districts indicate critical sites for action. The food desert is particularly evident in the Spanish Harlem and parts of the Bronx where it's also zoned for inclusionary housing. Zooming into our site allow for a deeper understanding of the historic and current processes that have shaped this urban terrain. We saw the large number of vacant lots not only as fragments of the urban fabric, but as an opportunity for intervention. Design can accommodate diverse forms of urban life at the neighborhood level and reconcile scalar incongruencies. How does design fit into the existing system within the site? And what impact can design make on the metropolitan scale? If the built environment is a reflection of zoning and policies, then these large parameters can also inform our design, uh, des design actions. These tax incentives are reactions to specific urban conditions and in turn have physical implications. Through a rigorous and iterative process, we evaluate current programmatic compositions and development potentials in various test sites. Assuming an increase in density for the area, what new forms of density can the site accommodate? More importantly, how can these shifts in density change and improve the dynamics of the site? Our initial strategy prioritized tactical densification through phasing. The array of public and private programs, multiplicity of spatial configurations began to inform more precise design decisions. We questioned to what degree can interventions at the small scale achieve the larger goal of increasing fresh food accessibility and raising awareness of healthy living. Our research allowed us to develop varying design strategies that could respond to the questions we are proposing. How to utilize these vacant lots, insert new programs, and test architectural typologies, but address the more urgent task at hand, availability of fresh food in our site. How does the intervention perform at the architectural scale and at the neighborhood level? Does it function as an extension of the community, spatially, programmatically? Here, we looked at different social anchors embedded within the fabric. Introducing a grocery store would spur collaborations with schools, community centers, health clinics, and instigate systemic change. We were not only proposing a project, but reinforcing new and existing partnerships. 
Using the grocery store as our primary programmatic driver, our massing strategies explored possibilities of combining elements that would benefit the community. With the greenhouse and store at the top, these vertical iterations created new typologies that projected different qualities of interaction, and through a multi-scalar lens addressed issues of social, programmatic, and political levels. Working at different scales raised questions of access. How do we relate these hybrid proposals to the pedestrian experience and understand these new spaces as pivotal roles in spurring social activity? And on a fundamental level, understand how the reflexive qualities of small changes within a larger condition have the effects on a city. Measuring long-term and short-term impact was critical. In designing within phasing in mind, our interventions had both spatial and programmatic implications at varying scales, as well as adaptability within time. We wanted to empower existing stakeholders and users in the community, but also understand the possibilities of change within existing policies. This project questions and challenges the nature of our regulatory frameworks and institutional mechanisms in which our cities function, and our research revealed loopholes and anomalies embedded within that. We responded by making them into opportunities for action, and were able to conceptualize a new set of programs for our site. But it's not just about the analytical or the methodical approach. Design is powerful because it allows us to visualize the possibility of our ideas and speculate and initiate greater degrees of change. Through testing different scenarios and using food as the programmatic backbone for urban transformation, each iteration had different and exciting possibilities. Our project drew deeply on the physical and conceptual elements of our site and really challenged how we can reframe the scope of urban design. We are interested in continuing the discussion around the role of urban projects in emerging contexts, but more importantly, it's how we progress through the conversation of how designers can reimagine and improve our cities and making them more equitable. Today, I'm going to talk about how design can be a purposeful dream turned into an impactful reality. My journey to the GSD is not traditional. I'm going to tell you a bit about my story and how being here is as much a dream as it is a rooted reality. I grew up in a fishing village in Vietnam with no running water, modern plumbing, or electricity. You can imagine my awe when I first saw car lights in Saigon, that was the moment I fell in love with cities. My immigration journey then took me through Bangkok and Karachi, where my childhood memory is forever instilled with images of poverty even deeper than what I grew up with in my village. I finally landed in Seattle, where I lived for 21 years. The majority of my childhood was in low-income housing with a single mom. Combined with my high school experience where our student body was made up of primarily free and reduced lunch students, I further understood the rate of poverty in our country and it led me to spend my professional years in public service. And then the cancer diagnosis came. I was still in my 20s. Chemo was a gift, a rare opportunity to reflect on life, service, and humanity. It was then that I realized I wanted to scale up my service from the city and state level to have a larger impact, especially having a lot more time to follow the news about the riots in Paris and the tensions of immigrants in our global cities. This purpose is what led me to the studio here at the GSD. I realized that I need to have more of a global context and build on my technical toolkit to expand my service and my impact. Our studio in Chelsea during spring semester last year is the beginning of a dream come true. Chelsea is the city just outside of Boston proper. It is a short five minutes bus ride from the North End. In the past 30 years, it has experienced a great fire, many economic downturns, and has been down on its luck. My classmates and I worked with the businesses, local elected officials to visualize what is next for Chelsea. How can it balance its delicious food, affordability, and diversity while being attractive to new residents and investment. This is what was at stake. We met with community members at schools, in small businesses, and listened to how they wanted to shape their future as a city, including an all-day workshop in 20-degree weather in April outside the largest grocery store northeast of the Mississippi that also happened to serve as their hub in the community. 
While doing local work in Chelsea, I was lotteried into an international seminar to go to Bergamo, a city in northern Italy just outside of Milan. The seminar was on inserting innovation into the city's daily life. My professors gave me the flexibility to redefine innovation as not only being technology focused, but on improving the way a street interacts with the rest of the city. Corangi is a street at the heart of Bergamo, named after one of Italy's most famous architects. Today, it is a place where a majority of immigrants live and work and where native Bergamo residents don't go. They consider it unsafe, violent, dirty. This is problematic as the street is at the commercial core and connects to the high-end Italian fashion district. It is where the conflux of immigrants' fear and integration of a new population and workforce happens. With a team of students and local community members, we interviewed, envisioned, and cultivated a working group with elected community leaders and businesses to redefine the way the street is used, maintaining its business diversity, and to bring in new investment. I was so moved by what we saw in Bergamo, I returned to Europe for a fellowship in independent study, looking at how Chinese immigrants are integrating into Paris's commercial core. I spent this past summer interviewing, meeting, and community organizing with multiple constituents in the two Chinatowns of Paris. The Chinese community in France first came because of World War I. They dug the trenches European troops fought in and carried the weapons for the war. Instead of returning to China, many of them settled to two areas in the city, Bellevue being one of them. Today, the area is home to a diversity of immigrants evolving throughout the years from Jews to Algerians and Tunisians, to Southeast Asians, and finally, the Southern Chinese. Today, Chinese immigrants struggle with balancing French cultural integration, Chinese cultural preservation, and new business developments. I worked with a young association of professionals to cultivate its organizational leadership and build programming to negotiate the cultural dynamics of what it means to be Chinese and French. Working together to find ways to alleviate the tensions between Chinese organizations, businesses, with its neighbors in Paris. So where to next? When I told my mom last night that I was going to be here with all of you today, she told me to make sure that all my words have depth and meaning and my journey in the past year at the GSD has been filled with many moments of depth and meaning. And my purposeful dream from my chemo bed turning into impactful realities in cities around the world. I hope to continue to make a positive contribution along with all of you in my future life as an alumni and to work with you so that many more people who have non-traditional histories like me can come to the GSD to have an opportunity to design, innovate, and carry on this impactful work. Thank you. Um, the Horizon House project began with an invitation to Harvard University to compete in an international student-led uh, competition. It was sponsored by Lixel Corporation of Japan and uh, organized by Kengo Kuma, the Japanese architect. Um, <laughs> sometimes you talk faster in public. Um, the prompt was an experimental house that would act as a retreat in nature. It's situated in Hokkaido, uh, Japan, which is the northern island. The first phase, organized by the advising professors Mark Mulligan and Kiel Mo, was an internal competition to the GSD, which was fun because it allowed um, uh, different programs to work with each other and compete with each other, as well as different years to compete with each other, which is kind of rare at the school. So it was great. You can see all the work on the boards with Phil Piper. From that internal competition, uh, this team of eight was organized. And the reason I include this slide was, again, to highlight the cross-disciplinary nature of uh, the team that designed this project. There's four programs represented here and a number of different graduation years. Um, as a team, we wanted to make we wanted to use design to make the invisible tangible. The first thing we tried to make tangible was nature. And this idea of nature is very um, rare in certain Japanese contexts, mostly the vertical cities. So you see here our main um, focus of the house was this horizontal band of windows that would connect to the horizon of this very uh, flat uh, area or that our house was situated in. Um, with that horizontal band of windows, we wanted uh, to start to uh, influence the floor plan so no, no matter what program you were doing you were always had this uh, view out to the horizon hence where the house gets its name from and like I said this is trying to make tangible this idea of nature 
here you can see uh, the competition floor plan and the top left is a living room. The um, top right is a uh, summer bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, and on top of the bathroom is a uh, summer or the winter bedroom. Um, the second thing we tried to make uh, tangible with this project is this idea of thermodynamics and that using them as a design tool, not just an analytical tool. So you can see here the top bedroom, um, this idea that heat would rise in the winter and be more comfortable and then vice versa in the summer. Um, so again, this was a, like really um, important to us as a design team that this would be in the design. Here's our main competition rendering. Uh, you can see in the left side are Kengo Kuma's house and Darko Radovic's house. We we're kind of poking fun at them. They were two of the judges for the competition. And there's people digging their houses out of snow, where you can see ours up to a meter of snow. Our house is still fully uh, functional, and people are enjoying tea inside. <laughs> um, the third thing we were trying to make tangible is this idea of uh, material ecology and like using uh, materials with less embodied energy. Uh, in this section, you can see that we tried to, we were um, using wood as the foundation for this house, um, which to our knowledge had never been done. Um, so again, the, a really important thing of this project was that we actually got to construct this project. We were there doing all the CDs in Japan. Um, here you can see uh, the structure going up, which Professor Hanif Kara uh, helped us a lot with in Japan is a seismic zone, so this was a very difficult structure to uh, uh, engineer. Um, the wood on this structure is Japanese large, locally sourced. The facade on the roof is the horse fence. You'll notice our little plot of land is missing the horse fence. We uh, recycled it and clad the roof in that. And the base is made of railroad ties that are kind of jangled together uh, to give it that solid foundation. Um, So here I included this to compare it to that competition rendering uh, of the horizontal window band. You can see uh, it's, it's really similar. We were really excited how similar our uh, project ended up to our original design concept before we went in, into CDs and DD. Um, so again, just highlighting this connection with nature. Again, in the winter, last winter was the first winter the house experienced. There wasn't a heavy snowfall, so we're hoping for a meter this year, hopefully. We can see how the house really functions. But the idea of using Hokkaido as a site um, is it's one of the most extreme uh, climates in Japan. So they're using these houses to experiment and uh, uh, study um, building materials. Um, as us, as a student team, we've been able to share this project. This was in the elevator hallway last year, and there's even a small uh, snippet of it out there right now. Um, it's been great to share what we've learned through this entire process as a team and continue to share it at conferences and exhibitions um, with our peers. Um, we're continuing to actually research the house. There's sensors, so we've been monitoring uh, the temperatures and the humidity and everything else. And um, what's really important is this uh, continued research is going to influence our future design so we can continue to make the invisible uh, tangible in our designs. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anita, and thanks to our talented students for really those, those uh, wonderfully diverse and rich presentations.